Hi everyone. Good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Um, we're going to start here in a few minutes. Just uh, before we get started, we have a short survey like we did last time. If you're interested to let us know where you're, you're joining from, as well as where you are, what kind of topics do you think is very important for the automotive security industry, um, as well as uh, letting us know, giving us some feedback. So if you go to um, pollev.com slash ASRG, this is Poll Everywhere site, we have an anonymous questionnaire. It's only two or three questions. Um, and actually, we'll, we'll see the results automatically coming up on the, the screen in front of us. So while we're waiting a few minutes, if you're interested to tell us where you're coming from and uh, what you believe is important for the automotive security area, please let us know. So if you're just joining us, we're, we're waiting a few minutes here until everybody gets in the call. Um, uh, while you're waiting, we do have a small survey. If you guys want to participate, it's anonymous. It's uh, just a small poll everywhere just to see where everybody's coming from. I see a lot of people start to give some feedback here. It looks like, uh, what, Detroit, Europe, Romania, India, Tel Aviv, glad to see it. Ah, Brazil. Very nice. Very cool. So for the people that are just coming into the, the webinar, um, we have a small survey for you if you want to give us some feedback about where you're joining from. Um, I think there's also a second and third question regarding what you feel is an important topic for automotive security. Please go ahead and, and give your feedback. It looks like we have 24 results currently. Oops, someone put the wrong location, it looks like. And we'll get started with the ASRG webinar shortly. So welcome everyone to the ASRG webinar. Sorry, I'm repeating myself, but uh, for the new people that are just coming in, please go ahead, um, log in quickly to pollev.com slash ASRG. Completely um, anonymous um, quick poll just to see where everyone's coming from today. Looks like US, we have one or two from Brazil. Looks like Tel Aviv, someone from middle of the US, not sure where that is. A few people from Germany, Romania, goodness check, India. All right. 
Great, we're just going to take one more minute before we get started here. Very good. So really interesting to see uh, where you guys are joining us from tonight. Um, I'm not sure if this was working quite correctly here, but uh, we, we wanted to ask you, why are you interested in automotive security? Why, why are you here tonight? Um, and as you can see, people are still kind of given their results, but um, Looks like A is the first one. It's my day job. So it looks like around 56%, 54 um, responded that you guys are working on this directly. Um, around 30%, not a professionally involved, but I'm very interested in the topic. Um, and then around 14%, that you guys really are the security researchers really getting into the depths, details, having some experience in the field. So, and then I'm gonna just go to the next one here and let's just see, we had asked, is there, regarding automotive security, it's a new field, but what do you think is automotive security's biggest shortcoming? Just to kind of get an idea, to see some keywords pop up here, we had the first one, VSOC, penetration testing, same as any OT environment, for sure, one of the hot items, culture, pennant testing, working as a security engineer, new to automotive security, complexity, OEMs are very close, they did not talk to academia, I think that's very true. We need the universities to be involved. Not enough people. It feels like everyone is going towards making smart cars, but not securing them at all. Well, I think we're going in the right direction probably, but um, great. CAN bus, attack surfaces, super keep giving your feedback. That's great information. This helps us, ASRG, to focus our activities in certain areas. So please let us know where you think the, the industry needs to continue to build up. So, and that's one of our goals as ASRG. So without further ado, I think we can go ahead and start the webinar for tonight. It's six after. Um, just going to switch over here to, to the presentation. Um, so ASRG, automotive security, community driven. Tonight we have a really awesome webinar. Um, it's, it's, the title is Lessons Learned from IT and ICS, SCADA, Cybersecurity Applied to Automotive. So Gilad Bandel is going to give us a complete overview of the lessons learned from the IT industry. I'll let him talk about this topic later. But tonight, I want to first talk a little bit about what ASRG is, what we're trying to accomplish, and how you can get involved. So shortly, who is this voice? Why should I listen to him? You probably shouldn't, but it doesn't matter. Um, my name is John Heldreth. So I'm working as a pro product security professional at Porsche Engineering. Um, I come out of the hardware engineering area. Uh, I did my Bachelor of Engineering at Purdue University and have been the last 15 years in the automotive uh, industry. 
So I started off in security or in safety and development, and now I'm doing security. Um, just quickly to what is ASRG? So first of all, ASRG is Automotive Security Research Group. We are a nonprofit association dedicated to supporting the industry. So that means not only the private and public sectors, but also the, the government um, as well. So um, this all started a few years ago when we started looking and understanding that automotive security was going to be very important for the, the security community. And we decided that it makes sense to build a community um, to help support the reducing the barriers of entry as well as creating competencies, knowledge building, creating an atmosphere for networking and collaboration. Um, this is a community to help and support each other. Okay, so please remember in security, we all have the same goals. We're trying to keep our customers, our, our families, our friends, and our data safe and secure, which can only be achieved together. So this is something that we can't do alone, and this is the reason why a community is so important. So, um, one of the ways that we do this is with webinars currently with the current COVID uh, situation. So hopefully in the future, when this is not such a interesting time, we will be able to continue to have face-to-face -face meetings, but we will continue having webinars as well. We plan to have webinars every week. So please check back. You'll see uh, new announcements on Meetup You'll see new announcements on the um, asrg.io website. So please check back, find out what's coming up. You'll also see it on our YouTube channel as well. Very nice. So how, what is ASRG? How big is it? Um, we actually have many locations. A lot of them are new. We are still growing. Um, we have 20 locations, so please take a look at the map and see if you see yourself or see a chapter or location that's near you. Um, if not, don't worry. You can always start your own chapter as well. This is something that we are very open with. Um, but ASRG is all over the world. We have currently around 3,500 members. Um, and a, an administrative team of 40 people. So please let us know if you're interested um, to start your own ASRG or to get involved somehow. That's here, we have different ways to get involved. You can attend a local meetup, you can start a chapter or join a project. So the attending a local meetup this means just kind of finding a meetup that's near you, going face to face, meeting, talking, networking with people that are all working within the same industry. Starting a chapter, of course, to if you see the opportunity in your area for automotive security or the need for automotive security um, community, please let us know. You can reach us at info at asrg.io or hello at asrg.io. And then the last one, one of the things we are doing now is we have projects. There's a lot of uh, collaboration, a lot of projects, a lot of IP, intellectual property, which um, many of the private companies aren't interested in because it actually um, benefits not only uh, himself, but the competitors as well, and the community as a whole. So we have lots of projects which are currently ongoing. Um, so if you're interested to join a project, let us know. Check out the website. Get involved in ASRG. So two ways that we have to communicate with our members, so with you guys, um, is to is 
over Slack and Telegram. So here are the two QR codes that uh, you can quickly uh, take a screenshot of or um, the links will be available later also in the YouTube description. But while you guys are taking a screenshot, I want to also tell you about one very interesting event that we have coming up this weekend. This weekend, we have partnered together with Secure Code Warrior and we have a secure coding event. So go to your local meetup. The links are there. There's invitations sent out. Um, and you can log in to the Secure Coding Warrior, which is usually costs uh, money. And we have set up this to be free for all members. You can go in. There's an ASRG competition that's set up. You can do training, you can do the competition, which is from Friday until Sunday, um, UTC from zero to zero, basically. And you can learn uh, best practices and you're in competition with the other members that are also in the competition. So take a look, it's gonna be really cool. We think it's a great opportunity to learn something. Also at the same time, it's in a gamified type attitude. So it'll be really interesting this weekend. So take a look at it, Secure Code Warrior, ASRG, the ASRG Secure Coding Competition. All right, I hope everybody's taking a screenshot. Um, also, we have to admit, ASRG, we, we do need sponsors. We rely not only on the members, but also from uh, sponsorship. So there's global branding opportunities, uh, access to exclusive content, post opportunities, and find talent. If you think about it, ASRG is a great way to have targeted advertising for your company. So. Um, please reach out to us, hello at asrg.io for more information. Um, this is, we, we do sponsorships which are only beneficial to both companies, right? To ASRG and to, to the sponsor itself. So if you think this might be an interesting opportunity for you or your company, please let us know. Very good. So, we have a very special presentation today. And this presentation is from Gila, Gilad Bandel. Oops, for some reason. And Gilad is going to introduce us to the lessons learned from IT and OT, as well as SCADA. So, Gilad, I would like to hand it over to you and let you start educating us. So, thank you, thank you, John. Um, my name is Gilad Bandel. I serve as a VP products for Arilo. Uh, today, I will be speaking about the lessons that we can learn from the IT and the ICS CADA uh, industries and how those relate to the automotive cybersecurity. And my target is to enable everyone to save a lot of money and a lot of time uh, by preventing mistakes um, and taking the good lessons that we learned from those two areas um, into the automotive cybersecurity. Uh, today, I will be speaking about the... So, one waiver um, to begin with, um, we're speaking about futures and future is very, very hard to predict. Um, so the things that I say here, I say them very humble, uh, hoping that I'm not mistaken and hoping that I took the right things from all those areas and project them into our industry. Uh, as I said, I think it's very, very beneficial if we are able to do this. 
So a few things about the history and explaining what is the ICS and SCADA and OT. And uh, I assume that some of the people are not so familiar with this area, even though it is very uh, close to, to our automotive. So looking at the IT, IT is something that started emerging the uh, late 50s, 60s of the uh, previous century and is uh, booming. So everything is now interconnected. Everyone has a computer, everyone has a phone, everyone has a uh, cloud. Uh, there are many, many cyber events on daily basis. So everyone understands about cyber and ransom and uh identity thefts and all kinds of such things so on the it i think that it's quite clear uh, to everyone where we're standing however we are not in the it area uh, we are both uh, the ics cada and the automotive in the ot operation technology um, uh, part of the networking uh, and my, my i must emphasize even though we are all uh moving bits on a network, it is totally, totally different uh, due to the history, due to um, the usage, um, and as such, the cyber environment that we're looking at. So the OT, uh, Operation Technologies, the ICS stands for Industrial Control Systems. Um, and we're speaking things like um, electric substations or um, water plants, uh, gas and oil pipes, hospitals. Those are things that need surveillance, uh, need data acquisition, um, but are very, very close to the automotive industry. And I'll explain in a second why. Uh, both the automotive and the IC industry, industry uh, emerge from very similar places. Uh, on the ICS that we call those devices PLC, Programmable Logic Control Controllers, in the automotive, we call them ECU. Uh, basically, those are devices that control a physical world with, with uh, sensors and actuators, and they have software inside. Um, the IC is one step ahead, and uh, most of the controllers are uh, programmable, so they are versatile. Um, in the automotive, still, most of the ECUs are uh, pre-programmed, but nevertheless, uh, they more or less do the same thing. Uh, communicating over a network and controlling um, engines or all kinds of actuators. So it's very, 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 very similar. Another interesting thing is uh, the fact that it converges with other networks. Uh, the IT and OT, for example, in electricity plant um, are interconnected. Once they used to be um, air-gapped, now they are interconnected. The same goes with the automotive industry, but even more, because we have so many connections to a vehicle. Uh, once it was connected um, only to the internet, we had the IVI, for example. Uh, now we have the connected vehicle and the V2X and platooning and all those things, which are very, very much connected. Another thing is that everything is wireless which makes life for a hacker, in many cases, much easier than a landline connection. So we have the key fobs and we have the TPMS and we have the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and 4G and 5G. Um, so those are the things um, that characterize the history of, um, of those industries. So this is a short introduction into the um, industry. Um, as I said, we must learn from the history. Um, and Winston Churchill uh, probably said it uh, in the best way that those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. Um, and we cannot afford it in the automotive industry. Um, we need to make a few steps ahead and faster. So looking at the system characteristics, um, IT once used to be a large uh, room with uh, noisy computers and everyone, everything was inside there. Uh, today, obviously, everything is connected. Furthermore, the nature of communication over the internet 
and in the IT environment is very chaotic, so we cannot predict who is going to go to which website tomorrow. Um, the computing power is growing uh, exponentially, so we have more and more and more uh, computing power. Uh, that means that we can protect better because we have a lot of computing powers to protect, but also there are so many things that happen there that we need to protect. So it makes life um, quite hard. If we look at the uh, ICS and SCADA, still many things are still air-gapped. So you can find installations uh, which are totally disconnected from, um, from the internet. Uh, but this won't last because there is a need for IT and OT uh, convergence and there will be communication and there is communication between those two uh, networks. Furthermore, it was proven more than once that even an air-gapped uh, network can be breached. Uh, as an example, through uh, ultrasonic uh, speakers and uh, microphones, through LEDs and the camera, uh, through blinking through um, screens and so on. So there are many ways that um, even air gap networks can be breached. Another thing which is very different than the IT and very similar to the automotive is the static and deterministic and predictable nature of the network. Uh, if one PLC is talking with another PLC or with an HMI or with a, a SCADA server, uh, this is going to be forever. There is no reason that some morning a PLC will wake up and start communicating with another uh, PLC. Same as with the automotive industry. An issue which is communicating uh, with another issue using a message ID has no reason whatsoever to start sending message IDs which is was it was not doing yesterday. Um, regarding the computing power, uh, the PLC has a relatively small computing power. Uh, most of the computers are relatively modest in power. They are not uh, very, very small, uh, but definitely far, far away from the IT. Looking at our industry, uh, connected car is here. Uh, air gap does not exist uh, by, by definition. So we have a connected environment, much more connected than, than the ICS SCADA and very, very dynamic. If we speak about V2X, you drive along the road and you meet new vehicles every uh, second and you meet um, roadside units every minute. So those things are very uh, dynamic in terms of connectivity outbound. Inside the vehicle, it is very, very similar to the ICS SCADA in terms that it's very static, deterministic, and predictive. Um, so we have here from the cybersecurity an easier job, I would say, compared to the IT industry. And it's very similar to the ICS SCADA. We have a huge problem with the uh, computing power, uh, even though there is an increase and we see virtualization and we see multi-core uh, systems on the chip, still uh, the computing power is very low. So it's very hard to protect. Uh, you cannot install a antivirus on an ECU. There isn't enough space there to do it. So we have some challenges, but as time goes past by, um, this is becoming less and less of an issue because the uh, computing power is increasing. Um, another th thing, especially with passenger cars, is the uh, sensitivity to price. Uh, OEMs are fighting among themselves on every single deal. Uh, so every cent that is added to the vehicle in the cost ends up with increasing price and redu reduction of the, uh, com the, the capability to compete. So they are very, very sensitive uh, to pricing. And in this respect, um, we need to understand the limitations that we have in how much 
money we charge for cyber security and how much money they are able and willing to pay. Let's look at connectivity. Um, IT has enormous bandwidth. Uh, Ethernet LANs are going to gigabits per second. You have on every single laptop one gigabit per second interface. Uh, one as well, as much as you want, you can have it. Uh, wireless goes over Wi-Fi, cellular, Bluetooth. The major protocol is IP. IP is, stands for Internet Protocol, and this is the major protocol used. There are many, many applications there. Um, and many application layer protocols, uh, HTTP, HTTPS, just to mention a few. And the networks are very, very interconnected. They go over private networks, public networks, multiple sites with VPNs, without VPNs. We need to allow people to work from home as I do right now. Uh, we need to allow people to work uh, on the move. So, it's very, very, very connected. In comparison, the ICS SCADA is very, very different. Uh, it's slow evolving network. Some of the installation are still using serial protocols. Uh, so not everyone moved to IP. There is a movement towards IP uh, and more and more protocols and installations are running IP protocols. But the number of protocols is relatively small. So we can count a few names like Modbus, DNP3, uh, 101, 104, uh, and so on. So the number of protocols um, and the complexity of those protocols is uh, relatively uh, minute. So Modbus is a very simple protocol. DNP3, again, very simple protocol. Uh, the 61850 is a bit more complex, but still very, very simple in terms of uh, the flow and the interactions that you see on the bus. Our automotive industry is very similar to the ICS CADA uh, and lagging behind. So most of the vehicles now are still using something which is not uh, Ethernet, uh, dominantly CAN bus. Uh, we see some flex lay lean and most for most for um, media, but in all our interactions we see uh, a target of moving to the automotive Ethernet and to IP. So we do expect this to arrive in the near future. It would be probably in a hybrid fashion. So for a few years there will be part of the vehicle running CAN bus and in parallel part of the vehicle running Ethernet. Uh, until eventually uh, all the vehicle will move to Ethernet and IP. In terms of connectivity here, we are in a worse situation because we have everything wireless, as I said before. We have a few devices connected. Um, for the uh, example, the IVI, uh, there are some insurance companies that are using the OBD to track vehicles. Um, so the vehicle is very connected. Uh, going outbound, the going to 5G, G5 um, is a major evolution and it will have a lot, a lot of impact in the near future. So this is more or less the connectivity. Now, nothing will happen unless there is a drive to make it happen. So no one will invest one cent unless there is a real drive to make this happen. And most of the reasons would be some decisive events and then um, it will flow. In the IT, there were many events. The first one, which was documented um, is back in 1972. Since then, countless attacks of uh, Bransome and uh, erasing data and stealing data and whatever you can think about happens in the IT on daily basis. So everyone is aware and something started there. Um, looking at the SCADA, definitely the Stuxnet event um, 
in Iran is the decisive event because this is the first time that it was actually proven that you can use OT networks to attack and cause real, real damage. Now, this is not the only case. There were additional cases, for example, uh, during the Ukraine-Russia conflict over the uh, Crimea Peninsula. Uh, for some reason or another, there was a total power shutdown in the Ukraine, not once, more than once. Uh, I can't say exactly who, 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 who triggered this event, but definitely showed the power of attacking an OT network, uh, for example, a power grid. And there are many more. Uh, many of them are unpublished, uh, mainly due to the reason that uh, governments or um, large organizations do not want uh, this to go published. So uh, we are aware of quite a few of such events uh, from my previous life uh, of uh, cases like ransomware or other attacks which went did not go published. They were uh, either censored, censored or uh, for many reasons, nobody wants this to go out. Fortunately, uh, or unfortunately, depending from which side of uh, you are looking at, no such event occurred in the automotive industry. So there wasn't ever a case in which a yellow bus packed with kids uh, was uh, driven off a bridge into the icy water of the river beneath killing any everyone aboard uh, due to a cyber attack. Um, we did see proof that this is possible uh, the Jeep Cherokee case uh, showed that it is possible to fully take over a vehicle and drive it off the road. Uh, but those were white hat um, hackers, not um, people that had some uh, bad intention in mind. So it, I don't know why it didn't happen. Theoretically, it could have happened. Um, I do believe that such attacks will be um, occurring during a strategic event, uh, like a clash between nations, uh, but definitely can happen tomorrow as a ransomware um, attack on a, on a vehicle or a few vehicles. There were some cases of ransomware of, on key fobs, uh, stealing cars uh, using cybersecurity means, but not something really that caused uh, huge damage. Let's look at the um, attack vectors and how things happen, how an attack will look like. Uh, whether this is important that if you're if you are uh, located in a security operations center, you should know and feel how this thing looks like and what to expect. So in the IT, there are many many opportunistic attacks like uh, sending uh, emails and trying to steal information or planting a virus or uh, stealing CPU power by crypto jacking or all kind of the of attacks like like this. Um, some of them are uh, targeted attacks um, like trying to steal specific information from uh, one company. Historically, it started by a head-on attack. Um, today, this is not the case. Uh, there are many attack surfaces. Attacks are very complex. Um, criminal organizations are, are leading those attacks. Those are not your kid that is trying to attack the, the neighbor. Those are uh, crime organization, terror organization, and they create complex attacks which go from stage to stage to stage. Uh, they include social engineering, they include physical attacks, uh, which lead them to, to the, the target. So this thing is very, very um, well developed. The ICS CADA looks very different, uh, mainly due to the fact that um, it involves um, national resources, critical resources, critical infrastructure. So those attacks would be targeted attacks, as in the case of uh, whoever uh, did it uh, to Iran or whoever did it to the Ukraine. There will be a long infiltration. Um, there will be a long lateral movement. It will take long time for incubation. Those 
things can stay dormant for years until they would be activated. So you might have a malware in your organization and you don't know about it. We have a huge problem with legacy equipment. Uh, in the IT industry, we change computers every two, three, four years. Uh, the ICS equipment, the PLCs especially, they are built to last uh, with an average lifespan of 15 years and more. Um, and with the concept that if it ain't broken, don't fix it. It's very hard to improve on uh, or to change them. So those are really vulnerabilities uh, because it's old equipment with no cyber security in mind when it was created and it lasts forever. I personally saw PLCs from the 80s and 90s, uh, which still work. The ICS CADA still has a small um, attack surface, uh, mainly because it is connected and they try to keep it as uh, disconnected as possible from the uh, other networks. Uh, but still, it happens, and we have a case, for example, with Target in the US, the um, stores there uh, that uh, through a USB, which was infiltrated um, to a technician on the air condition, working on the air conditioning, a virus was infiltrated, uh, moved to the IT network and uh, a few mi hundred millions of uh, credit card details and customer details were leaked to the internet. And everything started from the OT network and due to the fact that it was connected to the IT, um, it was uh, easy to uh, make this happen. Uh, still, the main attackers will be large attackers, terror organization, huge criminal organization. The process is, uh, is long and it will be triggered probably due to a uh, major events such as a clash between nations or things like this. The automotive um, is a bit different. Um, ransomware attacks are are possible, um, but there is a major difference between causing damage to a single vehicle or causing damage to the fleet. So a terrorist or a country actor, a state actor will probably um, target a, a major fleet. Still a long infiltration process. Um, a major difference is that you can buy a car and you can drill on that car. So you can have your make and model in your uh, backyard and you can drill your attacks again and again until um, you succeed. In the ICS CADA and the IT is a bit uh, more complex because you need to get to that uh, site and um, try your attack, um, which makes life a bit more hard. But on the automotive, we can just, just buy a vehicle, play with it as much as we can until we have an up and running attack, and then we can launch it on the whole, um, on the whole fleet. The attack surfaces, as opposed to the ICS and very similar to the IT in this case, um, are grow by the day. So every day you have more and more um, attack surfaces. Um, at the end of the day, uh, IT is attacked on daily basis. Uh, ICS KDA on very special occasions. Um, automotive um, is more or less a disaster waiting to happen um, because it's so easy to attack, but not yet performed for various reasons. Now let's look at what the industry uh, did in this case. So every industry reacted in a different fashion. Now the IT the major thing is protecting the data, privacy, information, uh, secrets, and so on. Um, so it's very different than the IT and the automotive, because both in the, uh, in the ICS and the automotive, we are looking at safety and reliability. Uh, we are protecting lives and property. I'm not saying that there is no damage if um, an IT system is uh, compromised. Uh, 
but we are losing information, losing money. Uh, you're not losing your life. Uh, ICS is looking at uh, critical infrastructure. So if you shut down the electricity to a hospital, people die. And if you drive a uh, bus off a road, um, people die. So it's a very different approach to what we are protecting. And therefore, the cybersecurity reasoning is different and the means to protect are, are, are different. Uh, one interesting thing regarding the automotive is a difference between the uh, OEMs and the regulation. Uh, the regulation, uh, if we take and we we'll speak later about uh, standards like the uh, WP29, is looking at the individual vehicle. So the OEM is expected to uh, protect, actively protect an individual vehicle, and it is expected to prevent the attack. Um, however, um, OEMs are looking at the fleet, not at the individual vehicle, and um, they are not looking at prevention. They are looking at response. So. An OEM would push towards something which will be detecting attacks, reporting them, so they can analyze and uh, respond at the later time. That means that the individual vehicle which was compromised, uh, lives can be lost there. Um, the regulator is looking differently and they expect prevention, active prevention in the vehicle um, and this is an open uh, discussion right now in the industry, and it would be very interesting to see um, where is this heading. So we're going to speak about this standard a bit later. Um, so looking at the impact and the industry response, uh, IT responded with everything that they can find. Uh, the nice thing about it is that um, hackers have a solution for every response of the industry. So you have firewalls and anti-spam and antivirus and uh, testing and secure software development cycle and um, having socks and certs and all kinds of things. You are pointing at a specific person, the CISO, a lot, a lot of investment, a lot of um, organization in general, an IT budget, uh, the yearly budget, about 15 to 18 percent of the budget would go to security. Uh, I wish this would be the case for the automotive industry. We are not yet there, but definitely this is the direction. So I would expect in due time uh, the automotive industry to increase the uh, investment in cyber security. If you look at the ICS KDA, uh, the response came late. There is some secured network uh, design, secured PLCs. Uh, and so on. So there is response. There are, there are improvement in, uh, in the ICS KDA, but still it's lagging, but it is moving. So there's, there, there is already activity in securing PLCs, securing protocols, adding IDS, IPSs. Um, to networks, industrial endpoint, and so on, industrial endpoint protection, and so on. Um, the automotive industry, we have two cases. One of them is the aftermarket. So whatever was is already on the road, practically impossible to add cybersecurity um, without any change. So you need to add probably a physical appliance that would attach to the vehicle, not very likely most likely in the high end or uh, military or government um, um, government um, vehicles, less likely uh, to happen, but still it can be done. The major focus will be the line fit. There are many things to do. Um, hardening ECUs, adding IDS, IPS, authentication, encryption, and we're going to speak about uh, this in a moment. Uh, one thing that was mentioned, and um, I would like to return to IT, 
uh, IT is sometimes uh, linked to um, safety and health, for example. So if you attack a hospital database and change the results of the uh, tests or change the uh, information of patients, yes, you can cause um, life-threatening situations. So um, indeed, this is a case. Uh, but in general, when we speak about IT, we pro speak about protecting data. Even in the case of life-threatening, it's still protecting data. Uh, less of the privacy, it has some um, life-threatening uh, implications. So um, this is a comment which came from the uh, audience, and I thank for this comment. Um, let's look about at, at uh, standards. Um, some people regard standards as uh, a bad thing. Uh, we want to work uh, freely. Why do we need standards? We're good as, the, as we are. Uh, but I think it's worth uh, mentioning that without standards, there can be no improvement. So let's compare the areas. Um, in the 80s, uh, well organized, uh, well established. Um, there are rules, there are regulations. Uh, some of them are a pain. Uh, for example, the GDPR, uh, in my view, created more damage than, uh, than value. But this is a personal view. Uh, the thing is is organized. Um, so if, if now the issue is that uh, I want to be forgotten from the network, that means that in terms of regulation, the wrong doings and the worst things are already covered. And if our uh, major um, concern now is that I want to be forgotten um, in terms of regulation, why OK? That does not mean that um, everything is done and does not mean that we, by regulation, we covered everything. So this is just to prove that having rules, regulation, laws, legislation does not solve the problem. They are still attacks, even though they are regulations. The ICS CADA reacted very late and only in the uh, recent years. Um, I can't say that I'm very happy, and I can't say that when I walk down the street, I'm very happy with what happens uh, and feel safe in this respect. Uh, to mention two cases is the US NERC, North American Electric Reliability Corporation, that created um, SIP critical infrastructure protection, but it's looking only at the uh, substations because this was considered to be the uh, most vulnerable and critical place. So. This is one thing that happens in the US, uh, not very harmonized. Uh, the EU uh, took, as far as I can tell, a much better approach, which is uh, wide, comprehensive, looks very good. It's called the NIS um, uh, directive uh, back from 2016. Uh, the thing is that the road to implementation is a long road. Uh, every uh, member state needs to take the NIS directive and um, apply it locally. For example, in the NIS directive, it says a large um, water uh, company with many, large number of um, subscribers. So that changes between um, the U okay, UK is already not there, not in the EU, but from Germany, for example and a small country. Um, so you can't have absolute numbers. So this needs to be adopted per nation. Each nation should take um, the local uh, version and adapt it. Takes time, not yet implemented by many uh, nations, uh, does not cover um, everything, but definitely a um, step in the right direction. Um, if we look at uh, the automotive industry, uh, the good thing about standards is that there are so many uh, you can choose from. Uh, the automotive industry is uh, more or less asleep, very, very re uh, late response, uh, many of them going to functional safety rather than cyber. Um, 
we do need to mention two things which are on the way. One of them, the ISO and SAE 21434 and the UNEC uh, WP29. Uh, the thing is that not all countries are uh, following those rules. So, for example, the US is not following the UNEC. Um, so harmonization here, it's still um, far away. In Japan, we have JASPAR. Um, in the US, um, there's something which is called the SPY, Car, uh, SPY Act, SPAR Car Study Act. Uh, which is a draft and in the US uh, government and legislation method, if a new Congress is elected and the previous con Congress was not able to uh, finalize and ratify the um, um, ratify the uh, law, then the new Congress starts from scratch. Uh, regarding China, uh, they were for the WP29, um, and they have local uh, regulation. China is a very, very interesting uh, market. Uh, one of the things which is interesting regarding China is that um, it's very much a closed market. So many of the uh, T1s, tier, tier 2s are selling to the local market. Um, so it, it, they, they do follow and they have their own um, uh, rules and like, regulation there. Um, but as I said, it's still new, so it's not implemented. And they're not yet, uh, in terms of timeline, I'm going to speak later about timeline, but uh, we're speaking about 2024 as the target year. So until then, there is time to speak, to debate, to prepare, to organize, um, and so on. Regarding the US, um, the target was that the uh, National Transportation Authority will issue a standard which will be applied to the US. And this was supposed to be part of the US SPY Act. The US SPY Act is not the standard. It's a CAS study act in which it would instruct the National Highway um, and Traffic Authority uh, to draft a standard that the US will follow. Uh, so it's very vague. Um, However, I, I, let, let's look at this question from a different perspective. Um, if you uh, have a car, you, you manufacture a car in the US and you want to export it, um, it's going to Europe as well. So if you have a US car that goes for export, it needs to follow the uh, European uh, regulation. Same goes for Japan. So um, the pressure here will be. Um, Am I able to export the car? And that means that I need to make it compliant with that uh, rules and regulations. So even if you are a US company, eventually as an OEM, you will have something which complies to the European uh, rules because you need to sell there and probably you will not have um, two versions, which would be the US version and the European version in terms of the um, uh, software. Uh, there are some comments here that I see regarding um, J3101 and so on. Uh, yes, uh, there, there, it's not a closed issue, so we can spend a lot of time. And I think that um, it would be wise to organize a separate uh, session on standardization because we can speak about this item for hours. Um, so yes, it, it hurts, standardization hurts. Um, let's carry on, and if there will be time, I will be more than happy to end, answer questions um, at the end. Regarding threat intelligence, uh, threat intelligence, something which uh, goes without saying um, um, in the IT. There are many global, national, private enterprises, bodies that are uh, developing and sharing and uh, distributing threat intelligence so people would be ready, well evolved, everyone knows about it, uh, close case. The IC SCADA is new. Uh, if you look at the Mitra CVE, which is um, shared between IT and SCADA as well, you will find that out of 
30 something thousand uh, CVs there, um, a few thousand of them have to do with ICS CADA. So there is activity, um, there is some information sharing, there is sharing between um, vendors and the industry. So if a cyber company, for example, detected, found a vulnerability in a PLC, for example, Schneider Electric Modicon PLC, they would go and report it to um, Schneider Electric. Schneider Electric will uh, fix it and um, distribute the fix to the customers. And only after there is enough time for the distribution, um, it will go publish. So there is a cooperation in this industry. In the automotive industry, back to square one, um, practically nothing. Uh, there is the auto ISAC. Uh, I hope it will be established and it will establish itself as a leading uh, body in the industry and it will collect a lot of information, share a lot of information. There is a lot of secrecy here. If an OEM finds a vulnerability, I'm not sure they will be very happy to share it and but they will prefer to um, solve it uh, locally with a uh, silent OTA or with some upgrade or call back to, to uh, the service center and then update it on the way. So uh, right now, this thing is relatively new. Um, I very, very much hope that this will be a change in due years because it's a real, real source for safety. So it is in our best interest to share this information rather than keep it um, 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 and, and keep it secret. How do we install this, the, the security? So in the IT, it's part of the network. It's uh, integrative part of the network. It is implementing from the day zero, from planning the network. Uh, it goes through the entire life cycle. It is updated all time, and I'm going to speak about updates in a second. And there are many, many layers and many, many devices along the way, just to mention a few of them, network IDS, uh, host IDS, virtual ones, firewalls, EDRs, VPNs, NATs, reverse proxies. Uh, I can't even remember the, all the names of those things. Another thing that the IT industry is doing is education and awareness. And I believe that everyone uh, participated more than once in his life, li lifetime in a drill, which was organized by the IT uh, department by sending a, a phishing uh, email and you were supposed to report it or something like this. Um, the lifespan of an IT device is three to five years. That means it is very relatively easy to change because you don't expect it to life to 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 last uh, forever. If we look at the uh, ICS CADA, uh, most of the networks are already there, so it is in most cases an overlay of um, security on top of the existing installation. Uh, for example, you might have a ring of uh, a Ethernet connected to PLCs, and then you would lay an external ring, uh, which is listening to the port mirroring generated by the internal SCADA ring. This way you uh, separate between the monitoring network and the um, SCADA network. So it's an overlay. It's something that you add on top. For new installation, Security means are taken into account ahead of time. So new devices, new networks, new sites will be with security ahead of time. However, um, the lifespan is very long, relatively very long, and it would take time until those things can can take over. Um, the cybersecurity uh, resources which are taken out of the network and the requirement are increasing all the time, same in the IT. In the OT, we have a different story. For the aftermarket, there are some I IDS and IPS solutions, uh, and there is they would raise some awareness for vehicles that are now driving um, along the roads. Uh, don't see it as a major 
uh, case, and I think this is a lost cause for uh, the existing vehicles. For new models, line fit, uh, there is a lot of uh, growing consideration, not yet fully implemented. Uh, yes, there are uh, secured gateways. Yes, there is segregation. Yes, there are some hardenings of ECUs. Uh, it's in the process, slow advance. We still have the issue of limited resources and the usage can increase so much because you cannot really change anything in the vehicle. Uh, OEMs are now expected uh, to leave enough resources in the devices. So even 15 years after the end of production of the vehicle, you will still be able to dispatch uh, software updates, security related software updates. Uh, can't say I'm really uh, confident that this is the way it works, but uh, that's life. We need to take into account that from the start of production of a vehicle, of a uh, model till the end of production plus uh, vehicle lifespan, we're speaking about more than 20 years. Very hard to plan from now what will be in 20 years. I can quote again uh, Bohr, Niels Bohr that said that predictions are very hard to make, especially about the future. Dispatching the software in the IT, it's very simple. Everyone has a virus update, software downloads done automatically from the internet or in a controlled fashion, but this is something which is on daily basis. In the ICS SCADA, this is regarded as the worst thing that the, can happen. Uh, it takes half a year to update a substation due to the rigorous testing and certification that you need to do before you actually update. So don't expect people to be happy to do daily updates. It won't happen. Some of the things, I saw computers running Windows XP, Windows 95. Now, it, they work, uh, but they are not secure. Um, replacing them, it's a total nightmare. Um, some of the software does not run on new so on new new Windows versions. It just doesn't. So you don't have any way to upgrade this this device. Um, there is a fear that the upgrade itself will be used to inject malware. So people prefer not to upgrade because they're afraid that when they are going to upgrade uh, on the way, there will be some malware injected there. Um, in the last years, we do see some change in this thing, but still very, very conservative, very slow. In the automotive industry, it's even worse. Um, it's a complex procedure. Either you do a callback or you do the over the year for new vehicles. Uh, it costs money. Someone needs to pay for the cellular bandwidth um, for unconnected vehicle. For sure, it, 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 it means a callback, which costs a lot of money. Uh, as well, here, there is a fear of potential injection of malware. Um, and if you, even if you have a very new good idea how to protect the vehicle, you don't have the resources to do it. So. Uh, this is something that we need to keep in mind. Uh, a few words regarding a few terms that I'm going to use. Um, host and network, IDS and IPS. Um, for those of you that are not uh, custom with those um, terms. So we have a question, two questions actually, which create uh, obviously four um, answers. Where do we protect? And how do we protect? So we can put our um, intrusion detection, or intrusion prevention system. We're speaking about intrusion detection and prevention um, on the host itself. And then we are a host-based IDS or IPS. Um, in addition, uh, it's not mutually exclusive. Uh, we can do it on the network it's, uh, itself. Uh, the fact that we do it on the network uh, is because if anything would happen, it would be visible on the network. It's very hard to conduct any type of an attack without having some traffic going over the network. Otherwise, how can you trigger something to happen? Um, 
so those are the questions. Do we place our security means on the network or on the host and how do we distribute between the two? Another question, uh, are we active or passive? Are we intrusive or non-intrusive? So if we are doing only detection, our main cause will be analyzing and reporting. So we would not influence the uh, traffic. We do not influence the attacker. Um, from the other perspective, if there is a false positive and we detected something as an attack, while it is actually not an attack, uh, no harm done. Um, from the other side, intrusion prevention uh, has to work much more in real time because it needs to protect every single uh, message and it needs to do it without adding uh, too much delay. Um, and it is focusing on detecting um, attacks. So those are the four approaches. Um, there's no right answer. Um, you need to think how to, what suits you best for your organization and for your uh, policy. Um, in general, I would say that OEMs are very conservative. Uh, they do not want anything to uh, actively act on the vehicle because they're afraid that uh, due to a bug in the intrusion prevention, a message which was going to the uh, emergency brakes would not go and would be discarded by mistake and cause an accident and then they would be liable. Um, from the other side, uh, whoever is driving a vehicle um, normally uh, would want an active prevention and definitely the uh, legislation um, and regulation. So this is uh, an open question. There is uh, more than one way to skin a cat and uh, let's look at the uh, different areas, how they are handling it. So if we look at detection vs prevention, in the IT, uh, we're protecting the individual device. Uh, there is a human being there which is looking at the events, analyzing, and can react. Um, if we do prevention is at wire speed, not everything uh, happens at wire speed, something we detect later. Uh, we very much try to avoid uh, false positive because false positive is a a nuisance to the to the network and it creates uh, uh, a lot of work but there are many many false positives in the in in an IT if you go to a SOC the, the, most of the day they are busy with uh, discarding false positives um, false negatives should be close to zero uh, there is no basic uh, baseline that we can establish we need to do it on the fly so establishing a baseline is not practical. Uh, deep content inspection is uh, required for superior uh, results. Um, and it's very custom that you do a deep content inspection um, and make sure that um, uh, information that should not go out the, or of the organization is, would not go out if it's uh, sensitive information offending content would not go into the organization. So people, uh, systems can look at the content. If we look at the ICS CADA, we protect again the individual device, the PLC. Uh, regarding a human administrator, I wouldn't say it's really there. Uh, there are more and more SOCs, but still not at the level of the IT. In some cases, they are uh, common IT and OT uh, socks, but still the IT people do not understand anything about OT. And the worst thing that you can have is an IT guy trying to handle an OT case without understanding. Um, we do prevention, but while preventing all other functionality. So we would not do any prevention if it would jeopardize the uh, functionality. False positives are not accepted. Uh, you should not have a false positive because if you have a false positive and because of this, you decided to shut down a substation, uh, a cold start of a substation uh, take weeks and costs a lot. The good news is that we can establish a baseline because everything is um, predictive and deterministic and we can um, uh, 
we can establish it and we can always compare compare to it. Looking at the automotive, uh, depending who are you asking, uh, whether you are protecting the fleet or the individual car. So as I said, some are looking at the fleet, some are looking at the individual vehicle. There is no human administrator in the vehicle. Most of the OEMs do not even turn on a LED or give any indication to the, do not plan to give any indication to the driver that a cyber attack was detected. Uh, the reasoning is that uh, the driver cannot do anything about it anyway, so why bother? Um, all the detection should not impact the vehicle in no way. And prevention should preserve all other functions and safety at all costs. So there is no case. Uh, so there is no case in which we are uh, willing to take uh, the chance that a false positive uh, will, will cause a, an accident. Um, the brace line is a must, even though it's a bit more complex. And life becomes very complex for us again with the sense of fusion, the fact that we have the V2X and everything is um, needs to be analyzed. Um, if we have a platoon of vehicles and the first vehicle is reporting a an accident uh, or reporting a its speed, how do we know that this is the real speed, that this is not a, a misbehavior? And how do we check the plausibility of those reports? Um, and everything on a very, very small uh, form factor. Uh, going to the network uh, VS host IDS IPS. Um, again, the same questions as before. The IT is doing a combination. The ICS SCADA uh, is mainly on the IDS because of legacy equipment and because of um, the fact that it's very conservative. In the automotive, it's going more and more, um, more and more um, active. Um, the number of protocols is growing and there are many protocols in one vehicle as opposed to the uh, ICS CADA in which there are many protocols, but in one side you would have, one site you would normally have one protocol. So the whole network would be Modbus or DNP3 and that's all. In the automotive vehicle we have uh, many uh, protocols, so it will be some IP and DOIP and all the layer two protocols, AVB and so on. Uh, some of the, those um, protocols are dynamic, large, like the service oriented, uh, some IP SD, uh, DHCP and the PIPA for uh, DOIP. So we have some complexities here as well. Um, Another great question is anomalies via signature. Uh, anomaly means that we take a baseline and compare to it and try to find which is out of the um, expected behavior. To have anomalies, you need to have a baseline because you need to compare to something. Signature uh, is a database of behaviors that indicate something. For example, with Signature, you need a database. And if there is a new attack, you need to update that database with the new Signature so it would detect it. This is the reason that why we have zero day attacks on viruses uh, between the day the, the, the vulnerability or the exposure was um, created uh, till the day there is a uh, solution for it. So in the IT, we work very much with Signature base. ICS and automotive will be based on anomaly because it can detect zero day attacks and you can have a baseline uh, to start with. There's an issue of secure by design. Um, some people think that secure by design will solve, solve everything. So more and more uh, systems in all automotive industry is moving towards secure by design. Um, this means embedded in the ECU, hardening, secure boot, boot HSM, TPM, uh, network segregation um, in Ethernet VLANs, uh, firewalls, IDS, IPS, and so on. Uh, definitely, this is not the only thing that you need to do. So you cannot have a secure by design network, say the architecture is good, I don't need anything else. You also need something that will 
independently and objectively look at the network. So there is no one solution, one thing that you can do which will solve all your problems. You need a combination and you need something which is a multi-layer in-depth approach for cybersecurity. We are um, on the way to the end. So uh, a few more slides uh, that I would like to uh, show before we summarize. So reporting and monitoring. Uh, with IT, it's very simple. Everyone has a SOC. All the information go to the SOC. There are software packages there called SIM, security information and event management, uh, which are collecting the information. There are well-trained teams uh, which are protecting, they are playing games, red team, red, blue team, and so on. Uh, you can have even third party um, companies that are providing uh, SOC services. If you look at the ICS CADA, not yet there. Yes, some are doing things, some are starting to work, some are starting to implement. Uh, playing uh, blue team, red team is relatively new. Uh, there are some MSSPs which provide OT uh, SOCs, uh, actually in Israel, two of you of them. Um, so this thing is moving, not yet there. Regarding the automotive, very, very, very good question. Uh, the reporting can go syslog over cellular. It can go through diagnostics through telematics. Uh, it can be on the same channel. And then you have the question, if the attack come from the cellular, am I going to use the cellular of the telematics to report back? Uh, and what would stop the attacker to block that report uh, on the way? Have a separate channel, then it costs money. So it's a good question how this thing is going to happen. Um, another thing which is important to understand that if you have one vehicle reporting, that's interesting. But if you have many vehicles reporting, then you need to aggregate and correlate and understand that this is not a local event, but rather a global event. Supply chain. Um, in IT, you go and buy a computer. That's quite easy. In ICS CADA, you go and buy a uh, PLC and a computer. So that's quite easy. The automotive industry, uh, was able to create a very complex ecosystem of tier threes, which provide to tier twos, which provide to tier ones, and OEMs that specify the requirements, um, and OEMs that integrate at the end um, everything. So um, very complex uh, thing, uh, very complex trust chain, I think that the uh, ecosystem and supply chain and cybersecurity and supply chain uh, should have a separate um, webinar as well because it's so critical. Last question in this respect is, um, who is going to pay the price? Um, in the IT, it's very clear, all of them. Um, it's the CISO. The primary person that is going to pay the, the price in case something happens is the CISO and his, his head uh, is there. Uh, the CIO, there is a new term um, coined by Gartner, which CDO, Chief Digital Officer. There are people who are in charge and you know who you can blame for any uh, mishap in this respect. In the ICS SCADA, it's a bit more complex because the uh, there is a spelling mistake there. It should be CISO. Um, so it's the CISO that is going to um, mainly pay pay the price um, in such in such events. Um, maybe the VP engineering because the CISO is from the IT side and the VP engineering is from the SCADA side. The CEO not very clear. In the automotive industry, it's a good question. Uh, mainly the CEO, but this wasn't established yet. And um, it should be clear who pays the price and who is um, responsible for those things. Um, I think that 
uh, insurance companies will pay here um, will pay here uh, a major role because they will force CEOs to take action and protect their vehicles. Now let's look at the future uh, with another nice quote by Isaac uh, Newton. So everything that I'm saying here is by learning from other people uh, with my hum humble addition of my insights. So the future of IT is very clear. Uh, there is a race between attackers and defenders. In most cases, attackers are ahead of the defenders. And for every new defense, there is another attack which is going to uh, overcome it. Nevertheless, you have more and more solutions and a lot of funds are spent by organization uh, on cybersecurity. It's very hard to calculate the return on investment on cybersecurity, life, life insurance. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there is awareness and people invest into it. In the ICS CADA, they are catching up with the IT, uh, regulation steps in, uh, CO step in. Uh, even though they are very conservative, they take steps. Regarding the automotive industry, we are way, way uh, behind. Uh, with the number of computers that we have in a vehicle, the only reason that they are attaching wheels to a vehicle is that the computers would not scratch, be scratched by the road. Uh, so many line of code, so much connectivity, and it's only going to be more and more and more. So awareness needs to be built up. Uh, luckily, there wasn't yet a fatal event, but we don't need to wait for one to happen. Uh, standardization and regulation started not yet there. Uh, hopefully will be harmonized. Um, there are a lot of investment in startup companies and in companies in this industry, and there were some acquisitions in this industry. Um, so people are starting to invest in those things. The target and the acceleration that I see will be towards 2023, 2024 due to regulation. Um, and I do see the IPS and the active prevention um, rather than the uh, detection only uh, to prevail. And even though OEMs would prefer to have only ideas, um, they will be forced to go to um, IPS as well. Some take home messages. OEMs and tier ones must address the cybersecurity. They cannot disregard it. Uh, it's here to stay. Uh, and if they're not going to do it because there is a a uh, mature and responsible person there saying that they need to do it. It is because the CEO likes the chair very much and has a very high salary and doesn't want anything to happen uh, during his term. And because uh, insurance companies are going to find a way in which they can uh, quantify the threat and the risk and would reduce, ask OEMs to reduce the risks and this way, it's a win-win situation because the fee is going to be reduced. And obviously, uh, the regulation uh, steps in. There is no one uh, solution to cybersecurity. You cannot put it in one place. It has to be a comprehensive, holistic solution, which includes a combination of things, part of them embedded um, in the architecture, part of it embedded in the ECUs or domain controllers, part of them uh, autonomous and uh, objective listening to the network or uh, protecting the network like an IDS. From the other side, once an event happened, you need as an OEM or as a fleet owner uh, to manage it. And then you need a SOC that would do it for you. Uh, and there is a very good question how to create a SOC in which nothing happens. Because 99.999% of the time, nothing happens. So if you keep a SOC uh, meant, let's say, at least two people, one of them is a cyber expert, the other one is an automotive expert, you need them 24 by 7, that means three shifts. If shift, it's, each shift is meant by five people, total 10 people on your payroll. 
Now, those people are going to be very bored because they will see every day, all day long, a white screen. So they won't be very uh, well trained and very well prepared for the incident. And when the incident happens, they will not be ready to handle it. So it's a real challenge how to create a effective and efficient and professional SOC that will be trained. Um, one might think of direction of a managed SOC, which will uh, serve many uh, fleet owners. And this way they can share the uh, expenses um, and they can have one uh, professional team that will see a lot of diversity uh, much more than uh, each one. So this is a very good question, how to create a good SOC. To summarize this, um, this was a very short presentation taking only the important things and trying to present them. Um, for the full information, there is a series of six blogs that you are more than welcome um, to read. They go much, much deeper on in every single aspect that was presented today. So you are more than welcome to visit our website. Uh, Obviously, uh, subscribe to our LinkedIn uh, account on LinkedIn and to our newsletter and read this blog. I think that it has a lot of information there, um, a lot of information there that can uh, help you. A few words about uh, who we are and what we do and why we think that uh, what we said here is uh, correct um, and has a lot of insights. Uh, this is due to the fact that Arilu is an automotive in-vehicle cybersecurity solution provider. Uh, we were established 10 years ago. We were acquired in uh, 2016 by NNG, which is a large European group doing uh, navigation software for the automotive industry. Uh, we're based in, um, in Israel. In terms of the product line and the solution that we provide, uh, we look at Canvas and then and at Ethernet, for Canvas, we look at the physical layer, providing a, a fingerprinting technology uh, that can determine the authenticity of messages because uh, Canvas does not have any authentication method. Um, we provide Canvas software uh, that can be integrated into gateways or into uh, endpoints performing intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, so it can serve both of an, as a network uh, and as a host, uh, IDS or IPS, definitely we are moving and have an Ethernet uh, solution, which we are enhancing and developing. It was actually presented at uh, CS in Vegas last year. Uh, and we have additional products in our pro portfolio. Uh, for example, we are able to uh, compress the Canvas traffic. So this is not a cyber product. It's a network optimization product. We're able to compress the Canvas traffic at 50% of the payload uh, without changing the frame format. So only participated ECUs um, can take this software and the gateway does not need to be changed. And we can also add to it authentication. Uh, and given the fact that we use compression, we can add the authentication in most of the cases uh, within the single uh, frame without the need to add another frame compared to other um, technologies for authentication, which uh, in most cases required two frames for each frame, one of them the frame itself, the message itself, and the other one the authentication uh, frame. So that would be all from my side. Um, now I'm open for any questions that might be. So um, you're more than welcome to um, ask questions. I will go over the uh, comments and questions which were uh, posted during the uh, presentation, and I will try to address them as well. So, uh, Gilad, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, a very informative and very interesting topic in looking at the different areas. Um, as Gilad said, please enter your questions into the live chat window and he will try and answer them uh, in real time. In, 
in the meantime, Gilad, I do have a few questions here that I've collected. Um, if I can. Uh, yes, add. please. The, the first question is, the automotive industry has to deal with all of these issues, you know, IT, ICS, and SCADA, and automotive. How, how do you think security organizations in each of these areas should work together? Okay, so the industry, uh, indeed, and it wasn't pointed um, enough, so I will uh, emphasize this again. The automotive industry is a special industry in which it has both IT systems. All the manufacturing plants are obviously controlled by IT SCADA um, systems. So all the controller and the production line are um, automated by uh, PLCs. And um, in the automotive, you have computers as well. So it's quite uh, challenging to have a comprehensive solution. So there is no way that one person will be in charge of everything because the skill set is so different. Um, so my advice would be that for each area, that would, would be a dedicated cybersecurity uh, task force, which will address uh, the specific area and will have the full authority and responsibility for that area. Uh, and there should be a third overseeing, a fourth overseeing um, uh, group that would correlate. So if there is IT and OT um, interaction, because IT and OT converge and they need to speak one with the other, uh, that team would coordinate uh, the interaction. But no way an IT person can give any advice to an OT person about cybersecurity because it's so different. Same goes with automotive. You need to protect the in-vehicle network, period. You need to protect, this is automotive cybersecurity. You need mm -hmm. to protect the cloud thing. So if you do software download, OTA, things like this, you need to protect that cloud. But if you do OTA update, then those teams need to meet together and find the mechanism in which the OTA will go down secured the image which is being sent to the vehicle is secured and nobody messes with it on the cloud, on the way, or while it is being burned um, to the uh, ECU. Okay, great. Thank you very much. But this, this actually brings up another question for me. Where is the difference between where is the boundary for IT and where's the boundary for OT in the automotive area? So if we look at the automotive, not on the production line, but on the vehicle itself, uh, the vehicle is connected to the internet by, or to the, the external networks by various means. Um, it can be the uh, telematics connected through cellular to the uh, operation center. It can be the IVI connected to the internet for um, just getting maps or uh, hearing music. It can be the uh, V2X, which is going to uh, V2V, V2I, I2V, um, and so on. Um, so the boundary um, at the vehicle is at the edge. Um, <clears throat> from then on, from the edge, it's the IT network responsibility to provide um, the the security so um let's excuse for one second the v2x which is a different area uh, um, so maybe we should have mentioned the v2x as, as separate but i'll pretend to it in a second um, the telematics cellular antenna is the boundary that the automotive cyber security in vehicle network should look at from then on, it's an IP network going over cellular, going over landline, going to whatever, to the data center. And the data center should uh, be able to protect that network. Having said that, even there, there are several uh, sub um, positions. There would be someone who is in charge of the server security or the cloud security, and there would be someone who is in charge of the network section security. 
the V2X is uh, a bit different because it has its own uh, security embedded in the channels. Um, so someone should be in charge of the V2X security, but keep in mind regarding V2X that the V2X security is speaking about channel security, not content. So even though the V2X is in charge of creating keys and distributing keys and CRLs, revoking keys uh, and so on, um, it is valid only for the channel. So if you have a compromised vehicle sending uh, rogue data over a very, very secure channel, it will arrive as rogue data to the target vehicle as it is. So we cannot um, rely only on the V2X channel security as a security. We need to have an in-vehicle uh, cyber security that is looking at the incoming traffic. You can create a uh, amplification attack using uh, the multi-hop feature of the V2X. So if one vehicle or few vehicles start to send messages and you start to propagate them on a multi-hop multi uh, fashion, then in no time the network will be um, under denial of service um, attack and it will cease working. So every section needs to speak its own language and protect its own area. And there should be harmonization and co cooperation and coordination between those two areas uh, working together. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there's also another question from, from Reiner Witzka. Um, do you believe uh, Nevada, so coming from yeah. VDA, will be a global standard? Humbly, I don't know. I, 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 I really, really, it's, don't know. I don't know what, what, what will, what, what will end up. It's a good standard, but as I said, the problem with the automotive standard is there are so many of them and they are not so harmonized uh, and everyone is working uh, to create its own standard. So I would prefer uh, not to see so many standards and I have nothing against uh, VDA uh, or any other body, but I would prefer to have one harmonization body that will create uh, one standard. Uh, even in the V2X, there are two standards of uh, cellular communication, one of them built on uh, Wi-Fi and the other one built on cellular. So even there, you cannot have a, a vehicle that will drive all over the world with the same V2X system. Um, so I am belong to those that think that uh, standards are very, very good as long um, as they are in singular and not in plural. Okay, thank you very much. Um, maybe one or two more questions here. So um, you talked a little bit about uh, vehicles that are in the field, how to secure them. Um, what about during the supply chain, while they're being built, while they're being designed? Okay, so two, there are two parts to it. One of them uh, have to do with um, when they are designed. So as part of the design, security needs to be day zero. Uh, same as it worked with IT, same as it's more like with ICS CADA. So when you have a new vehicle, um, security should be by design in, in, in the initial drawing that you are drawing the vehicle. First of all, you are going to draw uh, the cyber security component then uh, at the wheels. Uh, regarding the supply chain, as I said, this is a uh, different long topic. How do you ensure that uh, you are not using, or someone is not using the supply chain to infiltrate some malware um, into the uh, vehicle? And by the way, one of the nice things that I saw again from the ICS CADA, is that someone was sending uh, uh, PLCs, doesn't matter the name, uh, on the internet uh, at a very attractive price. And they sold it exactly to one customer, which was the target customer. Uh, that um, device came from home, from the, from, from the uh, 
person that sold it with a time bomb installed inside. Um, it was deployed in quantities. Um, and then a ransomware uh, request came um, showing that those devices in due time, um, the bomb will explode and the system will go down. They will cease uh, to function. So we see that the uh, supply chain is, um, is an important part of the um, of of this of the security. How you do it? You check, ver verify, certify, penetration test, uh, black box, white box, uh, testing of the devices to make sure that they are as safe and as secure as possible. Uh, mainly it would go by certification in our cases that you you follow the uh, development standards, secure development standards, um, ASPICE, things like this. Um, more or less, the, the, this, this would be the, the way. But again, the whole supply chain is a long, long topic that mm -hmm. uh, 30 seconds of answer is definitely not enough. OK. All right. Um, one more question here. Um, so we have, do you see OEMs um, and tier ones that are they're growing their own cybersecurity solutions in-house? Um, what are the benefits uh, or drawbacks of such an approach instead of this managed um, security provider? Interesting question. Um, in my view, everyone should focus on their um, places where they are best and where they have an advantage. Um, as you can hear, I do not sing at the Opera House, and this is for a very good reason. Um, OEMs should focus on specifying the needs, learning from vendors what's available, what can be provided, looking at uh, standardization and try to understand how and what they need to do to comply with standardization um, and specify uh, to tier ones. There's no chance, not even a tier one, would have enough uh, experience and mainly diversity. The major thing here is diversity. Um, as a um, dedicated vendor and the chances that um, a large OEM will encounter all the things that someone who is dedicated and devoted um, to this field has the chance to see, to experience, to gain information and to create a product which is a superset of all the things that were encountered, um, a tier one and the OEM, uh, in my humble opinion, will not able to um, to reach. So as we see from the IT uh, companies that are focused on cybersecurity are focused on cybersecurity. Companies that uh, develop um, and sell computers sell computers, and you don't find companies that sell computers. Um, and an antivirus or an IDS, then there are not, not so many of them. Uh, and even if they are, they don't have the best um, products. So those are different skill sets, different um, expertise, uh, different passes that you can grow. Um, so I don't see this um, as a very good option. Uh, I would prefer. Uh, not to buy from a supermarket. I prefer to buy from my uh, specialist shop. <laughs> you you don't want your general doctor to be doing surgery, right? No, I would not like my uh, general practitioner to uh, operate on me. Uh, they can give me some medicine against headache. That's okay, but uh, <laughs> that, that would be the the extent that I would go. All right. Well, um, Gilad, 
once again, thank you so much for the presentation today. I think I can speak for most people in the, the webinar here that it was very informative and very helpful. Um, just for everybody that's on the webinar, um, the next week, so first of all, this weekend, we will have the Secure Coding Tournament. The link is in the comments of the YouTube channel. It's going to be really cool. Check it out. Secure Coding Warrior is the partner here. Um, they've provided this cost free for ASRG members for the entire weekend for a competition. Then next week, next week we will have Dragos da, uh, Dabja. He will be, he's from Accenture. He'll be presenting the UNECE cybersecurity regulations for automotive. That's next week on Thursday, so April 30th. Come take a look, learn about UNECE. Um, Gilad, closing remarks from your side. No, I would like to thank everyone for listening. Um, thank you, uh, thank ASRG and John for um, hosting me here. And I'd be more than happy to share more of my uh, knowledge and information in future uh, webinar that will be held. So thank you, everyone. Great. And Gilad, we're looking forward to having you back. We know that you have many topics that uh, he, um, you're interested in, and we'll find an, another spot for you to make the next presentation. So. Um, without further ado, guys, thank you very much for everything um, and look forward to the next webinar by ASRG, Driving Automotive Security Together. Okay, thanks guys.